Hello and welcome to the 160th and patron-only episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Saturday, the 22nd of May, 2021, and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. Today we have part two of our discussion with Zoe Baker, aka Anarchopack, on all things anarchist and Marxist. Let's jump right in. I don't know if you feel that, but that's how I feel about it. No, I, I, I think that's a very interesting. But like, so, you know, how do you protect the officer, you know, the Macno's idea of this, of the centralized army? How do you make it not just turn into like a, a Bonapartist type regime? Well, yeah, that, that's why he thought it's important that everyone's elected by the soldiers themselves. But even the uh, soldiers have, even the soldiers have a different class interest than the general and, class. Well, and and crucially, the you know the the soldiers are inter- integrated and interconnected with the wider you know organizations, and also that they're you know being taught and learning about anarchist ideas, where it's a thing where if you're a bunch of people who have all spent ages learning about how not to oppress others and be non hierarchical and really believe that, that can have effects on your actions and what you do as a person or as a group of people, and it isn't at least I've not really read cases of the Ukrainian uh, anarchist army, say, killing peasant civilians in that were in community councils. I have read about the Red Army doing that to the anarchist community councils. But, you know, I, I do think it's it's an issue and something to yeah, think about, but I don't have any kind of definite solutions beyond, like, at least make sure they're elected and at least make sure that they're learning about anarchism, believe in anarchism, and are actively participating or interconnected with other organizational structures that are not centralized in any way. Or even having perhaps the higher levels of command structure being combinations of army and non-army official, you know, elected. Yeah, well, so for example, or, or, you know, things like, I think would be important to make sure that there are a certain number of women delegates, like automatically. Because one of the problems in the CNT was that most of the delegates were men and that shaped the kinds of decisions they made. Or, or even like, you know, <laughs> like non-military military strategists, if you know what I mean. People trained in like military strategy in the abstract that haven't got like military backgrounds and are more plugged into unionizing or political life. Or, oh, yeah, that, or whatever. that was the case with the people who organized, you know, anarchists. Uh, militaries historically, you know, they were trade unionists or anarchist militants who found themselves in a situation where they had to get like really good at fighting battles and they hadn't really had to do that before and they had to like learn as they went. And before the revolution in Spain, anarchists would often, you know, for example, spend a lot of time learning how to shoot. And there were a lot of anarchist action groups that had a lot of combat experience from insurrections on, and street fighting against assassins that were hired to kill anarchist trade unionists. And they were able to play an effective armed role in the early stages uh, of the revolution when there was the first uprising against the fascist coup. And they were one of the key reasons why the anarchists were able to defeat fascists in the streets of Barcelona was that a lot of the people already had a lot of combat experience, knew how to use weapons, knew where the weapons were, were already organized into combat groups where they knew knew that other people they were working with and had kind of bonds with them, rather than them all being, you know, a bunch of strangers who don't trust one another. So I definitely think that's like a something to learn from. It is very interesting though, because I think, you know, I think the core concepts of prefiguration are super important. You know, even in the even in the goddamn military, you know, in the military, the unions, if there is a party, you know, you're you don't think the party could, could survive. I think a prefigurative party. I, I think the answer is not out on a prefigurative party. No more than the answer is out. I think on unions because I think unions have been as crappy on the whole in bourgeois society as as kind of parties have been. To be honest, that's kind of how I feel about it. Outside of the CNT. And the I mean, Wobblies. There's, yeah, there's, there's lots of other syndicalist unions that have yeah, done good things. Yes, but like, you know, what percentage of the unions in the world today are syndicalist unions? Well, yeah, the, the historic syndicalist unions were like crushed. Uh, they, they were smashed apart by, by state violence. And the, you know, the there's no example of a decent Marxist party in the world as far as I know now. You know, they're all weirdo sects based on like the theses of the whatever, the third common turn 
1920, Stalinist, not Stalinist, um, you know, their party forms built for action in war. And that's still what passes well, us. I, I think there are a lot of kind of Marxist parties that they they essentially serve to maintain the lifestyle of certain people in the Central Committee. Uh, yeah, they, yeah, they, yeah, they get they get to be this kind of charismatic figure among the small group of people. Pro and and function of the organization is to maintain that position for them, and recruit new members as old members leave due to burnout or changing their mind and or yeah various factors right dying uh, yeah. sexual violence is often the key reason, uh, and so it's a thing of like they just exist to reproduce themselves and the lifestyle of you know the set the certain people in the central committee a lot of old guys in particular and that that's what they mainly do and they're kind of reading groups or they do actions but the actions aren't really effective and they're often just about again trying to recruit in order to reproduce the organization itself rather than do anything else i'm always amazed that anyone will ever join one that's, that's... yeah no i i am as well and i yeah i find it sad when you're kind of young people who join these what I would call cults, which is inside the, the, I don't think necessarily they all are, but I think a lot of them are. They lose year, years of their life to this weird group uh, that they're never going to get back. And they join for the best of reasons. You know, they want to make the world a better place. They really believe in it. And it's, yeah, I, I find it really sad and upsetting. It's often just being kind of taken advantage of by kind of ca charismatic figures or ideas which aren't actually implemented in the party itself. Yeah, I think I need to set up a cult. It sounds like a, <laughs> it's a, a good career move. <laughs> good career move. Yeah, getting back then to the, uh, which probably the Marxists who ended up maybe being the closest to the anarchists were, I, I think it's probably fa safe to say the council communists. They ended up like rejecting both forms, both the party and the union as being doomed. Like to me, I, I kind of, I can understand why people reject a form or another form mostly to do with like historical stuff i think you know at, at the at the minimum you know history played a certain way but i i think like when you get to the position of the council communists it's like they throw out the baby and the you know the bath water they throw out the window they throw the everything out you know the shampoo bottles and the whole lot like what are you what are your thoughts on the theoretical understanding of these uh, council communist dudes so I think it's really important to like locate their ideas within this like historic context where there's just been the Russian Revolution, there's been the kind of repression of the German Revolution, there's the whole history of you know Marxist parties in Europe that are coming out of, and and the crucially really bureaucratic trade unions that are interconnected with these Marxist parties, and so I think a lot of their critiques of those trade unions as barriers to revolution or barriers to the formation of workers' councils. I think that had already all been advocated and, and argued by anarchists since the 19th century. And the difference is, is where then a lot of anarchists go, well, how can we form you know, revolutionary trade unions to actually achieve our goals, which are opposed to and independent of these kind of bureaucratic top-down trade unions that aren't revolutionary. And then there were even anarchists like Malatesta, who he's initially really enthusiastic about trade unions in the... 1880s and 1890s but then he increasingly becomes convinced of the view that trade unions have this like inherent reformist tendency even if they're founded by revolutionaries even if they're syndicalist unions even if they're meant to be revolutionary he thinks just the activity of trade union struggle will necessarily result in the trade unions you know becoming focused on really important everyday concerns and the interests of their membership and growing as an organization but that, as that becomes their focal point, that changes the organization and it becomes increasingly concerned with its position within capitalist society rather than overthrowing capitalist, capitalist society. And that's why he advocates specific anarchist organizations to intervene in trade unions to try and push the membership or the organization in general towards revolution. But that's crucially a counteracting force against the general tendency of trade unions to become reformist and bureaucratic. And, you know, there are other anarchists who, for this reason, rejected participating in trade unions at all and had, again, you know, been saying this since the 19th century before a lot of the kind of actual observations would become, you know, certain kind of huge trade unions in the 20th century had occurred. 
uh, yeah, I, I think I said this earlier, but just to re reiterate, the in the Russian Revolution, there were narco syndicates who yeah, didn't participate in trade unions, even though that was their whole thing. It was like we're into trade unions. They go, they'd, they'd organize trade unions in America before they were deported to Russia. They brought their printing press with them to restart their anarcho syndicalist uh, trade union. And the Russian anarchist movement was the first movement to actually use the term anarcho syndicalism in the first place before they just called themselves, you know, anarchist trade unionists or uh, revolutionary syndicalists who were anarchists. But anarcho syndicalism, a specific phrase, was developed by the Russian anarchist movement, including crucially these people. And what they did is, yeah, they, they focused just on participating in the workers' councils because they thought the trade unions weren't going to be an avenue for anarchist goals in the Russian Revolution because they were so interconnected with the Bolshevik Party. Because I, I sometimes see kind of council communists online think that there's like nothing in common between, or like council communism and anarcho-syndicalism are totally different because council communists were like really against unions while the anarcho-syndicalists weren't. And I think that's kind of ignoring that the anarcho syndicalists had the same critiques of bureaucratic hierarchical trade unions as the council communists did. A lot of them had the same concerns about tendency for trade unions to become, not become revolutionary. And, and a core part of the anarchists in the CNT formed a specific anarchist organization called the FAI, crucially in order to try and counteract reformist tendencies within the CNT and, and keep it being revolutionary and committed to armed insurrection and, and expropriation. And likewise, with these Russian narco syndicalists, you know, based on their specific context, chose workers' councils over, over trade unions, which is similar to council communists in their context in Germany, saying we need to focus on kind of direct struggle independently of these huge trade unions connected with the parties and, you know, forming workers' councils as independent organs of, of workers' self-management. And a lot of the anarcho-syndicalists in Germany had originally been a tendency within the, those trade unions, uh, and then they were kicked out and then had to form their own syndicalist trade union. And the uh, founding congress of the anarcho-syndicalist international in 1922 was attended by, as far as I recall, some a few council communists who ended up not signing up to the, the, the Declaration of Principles, but they were there. Uh, and I also recall that there was a reading group in Germany, which was attended by both council communists and anarchists. So there were some conversations between those movements, although I, it's something I, I wish there was more about in English, because obviously a lot of it hasn't been translated, uh, always in archives, which I can't understand. But I, I do recall that there was some connections be between the council communists and the, the anarchists. Like one thing about the the union is like that the like the wobblies today the IWW they are like a kind of like a general union, and like at the time was the, the CNT I assume is the same model essentially as the yeah, IWW. So when it was first formed, it was a lot more organised based on different crafts, and then it was reorganised to be an industrial union like the IWW, and that was one of the big kind of changes to the organization that happened early on. That seems like a absolute prerequisite for any kind of anarchist Marxist union going forward. I yeah, yeah, I, I, I would I'd say so. I would agree. Because like you don't play off the separate, like that's the whole bourgeois thing. You play off the separate, if this worker group against that worker group, you can get good wages, but don't have solidarity with your, you know, lower paid or higher paid workers in different where they, they wanted to organize workplaces as a whole rather than being in like different subunions that, that weren't working together. Yeah, going back to the war one for a second, like what was the role then as Jurati Column? Did they end up kind of becoming like a kind of a, a vanguard, military vanguard during the Civil War? Oh, this isn't, this is something I haven't read about in ages. It's like <laughs> when you've read a lot of books on anarchism, it's like, oh, I don't remember this bit. I'm always um, impressed how <laughs> you remember all the names and the dates. I can't do that shit. Yeah, no, my, my memory is good, but it has limits because it's, it's often based on what I've recently been like researching. But uh, oh, yeah, that's a question where it's like to do it properly. I'd want to like yeah, reread stuff because but I because I, I really don't remember lots of details. I know what books to read to find out <laughs> the details, which is there's a guy called uh, Augustin Guillaume. I don't know how to say his surname because it's in Spanish. But he has written a series of books on the Spanish Civil War and the Spanish Revolution with a particular focus on 
the defense committees and the war in general. And they've recently been translated into English and published by AK Press. And so if people want to learn about the military side of the the revolution and what anarchists tried to do and what people like Dorigi tried to do, like he's the person to read. But I, I my memory isn't good on the details at the moment. And I don't want to kind of get things wrong because that is always frustrating because people will listen and be like, you know what you're talking about. This must be true. And it's like, oh, no, I misremembered. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm as good as the sources I read and can look back at and go, oh, that's what they say. Yeah, it's like uh, Manuel in uh, Faulty Towers. I know nothing. I don't know. Do you ever see Faulty Towers? It's yes, amazing. I, I did watch it as a child. I used to love Faulty Towers. And you watch it back now. It's so racist. It's aged, it's yeah. <laughs> really badly. All of a yeah. sudden, it's there's like a the lot one... of comedy that's like that. I was rewatching Life of Brian, and there's like transphobic jokes in it, and I'd like totally forgotten that this was a thing. Um, Man, you know, John Cleese has turned into, I don't know, maybe he was always, but he is a total asshole now. What is it with like, like my comedy favorites? Between Woody Allen and John Cleese, like I'm like one's a paedophile and the other is like, like just a, a, like a I don't know what he is. He's like a tax dodging millionaire. Like there's literally there's a there's one about an Irish builder who's like really stupid. Like there's like the Germans. There's just like loads of sexism. Manuel is like treated like shit. Like he's he's dumb and stupid foreigner. It's so bad. It's really bad. Sorry. Going off on a rant there. It's clearly <laughs> important to you. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's not. I haven't done it in a while. But it, it is uh, really bad. Let's see here. Okay. Like, so recently I've been uh, annoying everybody on my podcast about this book that I mentioned to you just off air, The Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution. And it's kind of like theoretical response to the the experiments in the Soviet Union trying to build towards communism there, written in like the twenties, and it's like just lays out the whole it lays out the whole century essentially, just tells you exactly what's going to happen, and it, it it looks at the fundamental underlying principles. So suffice to say that essentially it's labor time planning for an economy. Now I remember hearing you talking about I think the collectivist anarchists. They were into labor time planning as well, I think, were they? So what do you quite exactly mean by labor time planning? Yeah, okay, good good question. So the, basically the kind of solution that Marx lays out in the critique of the Gotha program. So you're paid your your wage is you're not paid in money, you're paid in for the number of hours of work you've done. I worked 40 hours this week, here's 40 hours labor tokens, and I can go and get 40 hours of goods for the 40 hours of work I've done. So there's mm -hmm. no exploitation. It's a direct one-to-one -one link between the uh, work and the output. So there's this yeah, kind of unity between work and output and okay, the inability yeah. for any exploitation to come in. Yeah, I understand. So this is, this is, a, com this is a surprisingly complex topic. So, okay. So in the first international, the first anarchists, Swiss so anarchism emerges as social movement. And there's a tendency in the First International that calls itself collectivists. And what this initially means in debates in the First International is you're committed to the collective ownership of the means of production and land. And this was a break with the more kind of individualistic or I don't know how to term it, but certain kinds of mutualists that also exist in the First International, they were only in favor of the collective ownership of the means of production and weren't in favor of the collective ownership of land and kind of large scale like resources of that kind. Uh, and the collectivists, a lot of whom were initially mutualists, they then switched, were often sometimes still call themselves mutualists, or like, I'm a collectivist and a mutualist at the same time. But a lot of them were like, they totally broke with it and they just thought of themselves as collectivists. And, and what happens is that then the anarchists, because not all the collectivists were anarchists, although most of them were, <laughs> so this is weirdly complicated. Okay. The collectivists who were anarchists, <laughs> they argue in addition to this, that the products of labor should be owned by those who produce them. So they often express this in the phrase that each worker should enjoy the full product of their labor. Now, they generally did not actually specify how that would be achieved. So how will the product, the collectively produced products of labor be distributed to workers such that they do in fact enjoy the full product of their labor? So for example, 
in the the Sintermere International, which they just called the International, but it's founded in 1872 as the direct continuation of the first International after the Hague Congress, where there's a split. And the Spanish anarcho collectivists, they advocate a society which gives autonomy to each community of producers and each receives according to his production. But they don't actually say how we're going to do that. They instead think that this is just going to be decided by different communities how to achieve this goal. And this isn't something that we're going to like work out now. This will be worked out during the revolution itself by workers. Now, some collectivists did advocate labor vouchers where people, you know, you're paid for like 30 hours of work and then you go to a store where things are priced based on uh, yeah, yeah. a system and then they exchange them. And so there isn't money. You can't accumulate them. There's no exploitation. By accumulate, I mean, like, you know, you can't like trade labor vouchers of other people. They're tied to you as an individual. So you can't kind of become like a little capitalist hoarding labor vouchers or something. So some advocated that. But what's interesting is that when they do, so a guy called James Gilliam, he actually advocates Marx's lower phase versus higher phase, phase communism before Marx himself does. So in 1874, he writes a text called Ideas on Social Organization. And within that, he says, he, proposed, he first of all reiterates, you know, communities themselves will work it out. But here's some suggestions. And his suggestion is that we initially use labor vouchers, but then once we've achieved abundance and the economy stabilized and, you know, we've defeated, we've essentially achieved, you know, the, our, our goals and have overthrown the ruling classes fully and so on and defended against reaction, then we can go towards full distribution according to need. So it's basically the same as lower versus high phase communism. But in the international, that I've not found evidence that was actually the majority position. And what ends up happening is that over time, people who, what anarcho-collectivism means in many places changes and labor vouchers for a lot of them become the way in which they think we can deal with how to distribute the products of labor. But that wasn't the initial position when it was actually developed. And it was still the case that when those later debates were happening the old anarchists who'd been around when it had first emerged were like what are you you know people talking about collectivism doesn't specify one way to distribute products of labor it actually says communities themselves should figure it out and labor vouchers is one potential way but it's not assumed to be the way to do it and in the 18th in kind of 1876 onwards although it kind of was a bit before but what's called a narco communism emerges where they say that we need to be explicitly committed to the collective ownership of the products of labor and distribution according to need, rather than thinking like, you know, communities themselves will figure it out. And by the way, labor vouchers, maybe that could be a good way of doing it. Uh, they're instead like, no, we need to be explicitly committed to this system of distribution and this goal. They don't think they should be violently imposed on people. So, you know, they do think communities should work themselves at how to do it, but they think those communities should try to create communism. And in a revolutionary situation where there is an abundance, they advocated rationing as a way to distribute according to need. So rather than people getting labor vouchers based on how much work they've done, you are instead allocated a certain number of, say, points just because you exist. And you can then exchange those for things which are being collectively produced at this you know, store. And then once we're outside of this dire revolutionary situation or war or and we've achieved abundance, then we have full access to the products of labor and we, we get rid of the rationing system for, you know, most things that, that, that are produced. And so it's it's kind of different to like Marx's conception of lower versus higher phase communism, but they are still committed to the idea that there's going to be a difference between communism during the revolution and after. Although there were some anarchists who rejected that and were like, no, we should have full access straight away, even during the revolution. And they thought that because in capitalism, so much stuff is produced that, you know, we will just be able to go to all these stores or warehouses and just live off what's been produced already that hasn't been sold yet. And they, it was called taking from the pile was the phrase they use, which is kind of a, not quite a perfect translation, but it I think, suggests what they thought, which is, you know, you have this big pile of stuff and then we'll have communism during the revolution and people just be able to take what they need. Yeah, we've achieved communism during the revolution. And in response to this, other anarcho-communists were like, yeah, not much of that stuff has actually been produced and will very quickly run out of what is in these storehouses. And, you know, scarcity and is, can be a problem when you're trying to totally reorganize the economy. 
And so we should have some kind of rationing system during that transition, but still based on distribution according to need. Uh, and this was actually done by some villagers during the Spanish Revolution, where they did actually do the rationing system, because some of them initially tried to go full, like, let's abolish money, do communism straight away. And then they weren't in a position to do that because the rest of Spain was kind of still like a market economy. Uh, so you, you, you have this kind of coexistence of like market socialism in some parts of Spain with combined with planning to a huge extent in some industries within this wider market economy, also having some villages which have done like small scale communism via a, a, a rationing system. So it's this, this kind of weird mixed economy that ends up emerging during the kind of first few years of the revolution. It seems to like, you know, mirror in many ways what happened in the Soviet Union. They tried to go to, well, they had rationing and also went to try to go to just kind of like uh, based on, on need and planning without a unit of account as well. So there's lots of kind of similarities between the two camps. It, uh, like from Marx's point of view, like reading it again with respect to that, that book, like I think like the interpretation I have of it is that like Marx sees like labor time planning as the kind of measure which allows the economy, a socialist economy to calculate, but it's not exploitative and you don't end up with the weird value uh, shenanigans and crisis theories coming up because of the measure is operates differently. But as like things get more and more productive, the amount of work that people have to do gets less and less to the extent that even though we're still recording our hours, our production is so bountiful that we end up just like doing work because we like dig it as opposed to we need to do it to get a bunch of goods. And that like, you know, this kind of historical materialist view of like, we're going to end up still with some of our bourgeois kind of ideas about, well, I worked more than him this week. You know, I should get, get more than him versus like kind of share economies that might have been around in like hunter gatherer times, you know, predominantly hunter gatherer times that the actual political economy of our first socialist phase will undoubtedly inherit historical baggage from our previous phase. So I, I kind of, um, I, I, re I really do like Marx's kind of, I do like that interpretation of the conception. I think it's, I think it's what Marx is getting at. I don't know what you think of that. So I, I agree with the idea that Marx is committed to the view that you initially have some kind of labor voucher system as a intermediary way in which people are participating in other communist social relations. So like work, you know, workers' councils, how decisions are made, how the economy is structured, trying to have decentralized planning that transform people till they then get to a point where we then just have, you know, full distribution going to need without, without labor vouchers. And in the Spanish uh, revolution, there were issues where, for example, like the CNT was on paper committed to men and women receiving the same wages. And that was like one of their like core commitments, but you had factories. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. So yeah, you had factories where a lot of the women did certain kinds of work and certain, the men in that factory did other kinds of work. And the men would argue our work is way harder than theirs. So we should be earning more. And that was then what happened because the, the main delegates in charge of that workplace were men who, who thought this was the case. And you had women kind of arguing with them about it. So yeah, no, the, the, but the, there were, but that's again, I think internalization of this, you know, like bourgeois ideology to sound like Zizek, where they were still kind of thinking those terms, and then it was mediated like through sexism, where they were like, the work we do is really difficult, unlike what these women are doing, even though what the women are doing was actually also really difficult and tiring, while also having to do housework and look after kids. So actually, yeah, <laughs> the, the men had not thought it through, and it was frustrating. But yeah, that, that was that was one factory. I I'm, I'm, I don't know information on, on other ones. But that's why I, I know I, I have this view of like, there are going to be lots of different experiments during any revolutionary transition. And not all of them will work. What we can kind of learn as we go. And I think it's really important that those experiments are allowed to occur because people can you know learn through doing and, and uh, be transformed through that experience. And I prefer that to a situation of a bunch of bureaucrats who don't know anything about local conditions telling everyone what to do based on the ideas they happen to have. I'd rather have local people trying to figure things out. And that's why there's so much variety between the different collectives in the, the countryside during the Spanish Revolution, just because different groups of people have uh, different ideas, even though there are also, you know, at the same time, lots of things that they have in common, like a lot of, you know, they made decisions using general assemblies. 
Although again, sometimes like sexism was a problem. Like I remember reading about one general assembly where the men in the village, because they were really sexist and it was the 1930s, they didn't think the women should be allowed to join in because the women weren't doing the same kind of work the men were. So therefore don't shouldn't have a right to have a say in decisions about how the production is organized. And they ended up putting it to a vote and it, they ended up allowing the women to participate. But it had to be debated and discussed is the thing. And that's something which, like, it's really horrible that that happened. But when you're in a situation where there are a bunch of sexist dudes and it's the 1930s, it's like you have to work with what's there and try and push them, yeah. push them forward. Because, you know, the alternative is they just continued, like, being terrible and doing terrible things. So you have to kind of work with what's there, which often isn't good because people have internalized a lot of really awful beliefs. Yeah, one thing I would say as well, though, is like that I think... You know, I'm just going to talk about that book. To, uh, no, I just annoy everybody about this book, right? But, like, I feel as in, like, we got some answers from that first revolutionary socialist commie phase, you know, 100 years ago, whatever. Like, on some level, we have to learn our lessons and try and implement the, the learnings as well, as opposed to purely experiment each time round. You know what I mean? Um, well, yeah, no, I, and I, I think that's part of the value of the experiments is we can, like, read, say, like, Gaston Laval's Collectors in the Spanish revolution and see all the different ideas people try to do and be inspired by that and try to learn lessons from it like i i I'm, i don't think we should reinvent the wheel and that's part of why i'm trying to spread kind of all these old ideas uh, to as many people as possible where not in the sense of like you must agree with what this dead guy with a beard said on everything but more kind of like there are some lessons here they have things that they can teach you they have things that even when you disagree they make you think in new ways and that can be really valuable they change your perception of what is possible and what can be thought. 100%. I'll, I'll, I'll close with just one last thing. I don't know, we've been going for nearly two hours. Yeah, it's long. <laughs> we've, we've gone all, all over the fucking shop. Well, I, I, I'm going to go back, I'm going to push back on you a little bit about the party form, just as an example for how party forms, if they have structures or politics that are very meaningful, can maintain coherence so for example i would put forward as an example say like Sinn Féin in ireland have had a a policy of never taking their seats that they win in the uk parliament and like that actual platform has is over 100 years old now and to this day they've never taken a seat in the uk parliament because they think it's basically it, it doesn't have any jurisdiction over say the island of ireland and they've maintained that through like all manner of political crises, you know, so I, I do think there is a possibility for the politics or the, uh, you know, not just the politics, obviously, but the structure, the prefigurative nature, not that Sinn Féin is that decentralized. I, I, I'm i not saying that, but I think that that policy is probably set by their general AGM or whatever. I, I probably is. Uh, but I, I think that there are instances where they can, I, I, I think that parties can do things like that, but it's in the it's in the vast minority is what I would agree with you. Much like like the CNT and the IWW and the the syndicalist unions like that hardly exist today are in the vast minority. But the potential is there if there is a if there is a social movement behind them. So I think yeah, that is an example of how a certain principle can be maintained. Which makes a lot of sense if, like, in living memory, you've witnessed, like, brutal British counterinsurgency destroy people's lives. And the, you know, whole history of uh, British relations with Ireland being extremely bad. I, I can understand in that situation why people would remain committed to that principle. But I don't think it kind of follows from that one example about that one specific thing that in general... It won't have all these negative effects, especially for social movements trying to achieve you know, socialism, as opposed to, say, I know, like nationalist movements that want independence, but aren't actually committed to, say, you know, the abolition of capitalism and the state as a goal. Where if that's your goal, then I think participating in the state is always a bad idea because you end up, you know, it, 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 it ends up transforming social movements and various negative ways, like becoming more hierarchical, becoming reformist, becoming more bureaucratic, and crucially developing an interest in the existing state and thinking like, yeah, we can work with these other politicians to make things better and, and 
people become yeah. less and less revolutionary over time. And, you know, for, for most of the s situations when we're thinking about parliamentary politics, it is one of, you know, the Democrats and the Republicans exist. How should we relate to them? How's, and, and, how's... and given that being the case for most of the situations, I think we should make general claims based on that. Well, I think you can make general claims based on union organisation that are nearly as devastating as the claims against political, to be honest. But I don't think you should try either. That, you know, I, I, but I, but I, I think I, with trade unions, the key point is you have loads of examples of of either rank and file membership doing really great stuff independently of the bureaucracy or syndicalist trade unions doing really effective stuff which are structured in a very different way in a very different politics to other trade unions. I think, well, with political parties that engage in parliamentary politics, you have, you know, the whole history of social democracy where they, you know, they cease to be revolutionary. And I think that's just inherent to participating in the existing state. Uh, but I would say as well, though, that like, say, the SPD, for example, half of them were actually social democrats. They were never revolutionary. And I think the pressure is on a party that has that is basically split, you know, no more than, say, the the UK Labour Party is split between, so, you know, like a, a social democrat like Jeremy Corbyn and neoliberals like the rest of them, that the, the contradictions will play in a certain way. But, um, you know, this is... This is the age-old debate, isn't it? This is the age-old debate. Anarchists against Marxists. What do you call it? We shouldn't call ourselves Marxists. We should. It's you know. We should call ourselves communists. But uh, party communists. Not that's even. That sounds even worse. Fuck's sake. What am I talking about? I'll stick with Marxist. <laughs> Marxist anarchist. Um, <laughs> that's a dumb one. Yeah. No. So I just thought I'd throw that in there, just for like. So like, uh, say for example, say like thinking creatively, like say like strategies of abstention. You know, like win forty percent of the seats and never take them in Parliament. You know, like I, I think there's ways. Commit to never taking actually uh, ministerial roles. Commit to never actually taking control until, like, basically uh, you get to rewrite the constitution in uh, communist anarchist lines. <laughs> well, I think, like, you know, like I just, you know, I don't think that's kind of viable. And where, like, so for example, you know, let's say you socialists take over the Labour Party again, manage to win an election. And then all these MPs don't take, you know, their seats. Yeah. Well, then what happens is all these people who voted for the Labour Party are now like, we hate you. You lied to us. Oh, uh, yeah. We're no, never going to vote not, for you for again. You know, yeah, like, I'm not, I'm not I, forward, like, I, know, I, I, don't, I don't think it would any it build towards anything effective. I think it would just disintegrate the organisation. No, no. Like, I look, um, I'm saying that and I understand in the specific context of an, a, a political party in Ireland that's responding to English colonialism, then I understand why the membership would be supportive of that position of not participating. But I don't see that translating to like other contexts. Uh, why can't proles be have that hatred for the capitalist state? I just don't think, I, I don't think give it existing Come on now, we're talking about <laughs> revolutionaries. Like yeah, I, why can't uh, revolutionary poles fucking hate the they, state that much? Though revolutionary workers who are, will be a minority of any party that is capable of of winning a, an, an election or doing being in any way significant in like the uk or france or america because we have these very exciting basically two-party systems and that's that's the situation we find ourselves in um, but uh, yeah I, I don't know I, I i would say to you like that like say for example the reason why i'm going a bit hard you know is like when i was a kid growing up in say this in the republic of, you know in the south of ireland like Sinn Féin were yeah they didn't even have a seat they didn't win a a seat in in the irish parliament until 1995 or something like that and i i think the nature of political party growth is to do with crises like i think if you look at how the spd grew is to do with like crises over 1870 war against France or et cetera, et cetera. And like in Ireland, the Sinn Féin have basically had some steady growth, but would, would basically grow in jumps when crises in the political system would allow, would, would make people in society go, well, oh, what about these guys? And like, they've literally gone from being a, a, a non-entity in the, in the South to now the biggest party and probably the next party of, of government. Now I'm not putting forward like bourgeois, 
<laughs> like let's take the bourgeois state. But what I'm trying to get to is that I think like even if you had a group of revolutionary Marxists like in uh, or a co- commu- uh, communists, anarchists, whatever we want to say, would the party would probably or the organization would grow in, in fits and, in, and starts due to capitalist crisis. And like uh, that's the way I think about it. I don't think like we're going to, you know, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. It's a long historical process, both whether it's the anarchist formation of building up general unions or a Marxist formation of building up a revolutionary party or some kind of synthesis between both. It's it's a it's a hundred year project. And I think the dynamics are are nonlinear and jump in in relation to capitalist crisis. I don't think there's a question there, but I want you to respond. <laughs> um, so I agree that social movements often grow in response to wider events in society. So like, for example, there were expansions in the UK anarchist movement historically in response to certain kind of crises around like unemployed people that they then try to organize. And then when those kinds of things weren't happening, they kind of confound it difficult to organize uh, workers because there weren't these kind of wider opportunities presenting themselves. Same with when American anarchists organized unemployed people in the 1920s. You know, there, there were loads of unemployed people because of the dynamics of capitalist society. And then there were a bunch of anarchist organizers who then formed like an unemployed workers union of, uh, connected with the IWW and would, you know, engage in direct action and, and try to spread radical ideas through that. So I think we agree about that. It's not just like we just do our thing and we'll grow. It's like growth is about intervention in ongoing situations, which give us opportunities that we have to take advantage of. It's not like an automatic thing. It's not like there is this big economic crisis and then loads of workers will become radicals engaging in huge strikes. It's like, no, like actual people have to go and organize and enable and encourage those people to take that action. It's not a kind of automatic response to external situations. There's human agency involved. And so it's about how social movements that are revolutionary can successfully intervene in these ongoing situations to take advantage of them and not like miss those opportunities and and, and notice when, when they're there. So I think we agree about that. I think we, we're going to disagree about the party uh, in the sense, and, and participating in elections, even if it's just to spread ideas for the reasons you know I've, I've already gone over where anarchists are committed to the unity of means and ends. I think the means you engage in to determine the ends you arrive at and we think that the means of participating in elections, even if it's just to spread ideas taken on a life of their own and negatively affect participants in social movements and who's drawn to those social movements. So anarchists would often talk about how you can have these political parties that start off being uh, radical and then to win elections, they have to adopt a less and less radical approach till they're radical just in name and all their actual everything they're actually doing isn't anymore. And then you attract essentially careerists and people who want to have a successful career as a politician. And so in France, for example, you know, there were people who had been hardcore revolutionaries, like really committed to the general strike, had participated in the French socialist parties and also trade unions. And when they become high up politicians, they rep- violently repress striking workers. Like they don't just like, not do the things they promise. They like actively repress uh, social movements with state violence and like abandon all their old views. And that's just the inevitable outcome of their position. And I'm very skeptical of the ability of a political party to maintain over a long period of time that commitment to not participating in the existing system where even, so as far as I understand, even with Sinn Féin, they do, do they participate in the Republic. political city, yeah, the Republic itself, and they just refused to participate in the English Parliament. Yeah, they actually like they used to refuse to participate in the in the South, and they mm-hmm. changed that policy, but they've maintained the policy against the UK Parliament. Well, I, I think that shift in policy kind of like relates to my point, right? Where like <laughs> they see an opportunity in their immediate context, and like, yeah, we should now change that and participate in the existing structure within our context we're obviously still maintaining the like opposition to the british parliament but i um, think like in the Sinn Féin case sense, given their very strong feelings about the subject right 
Well, like I think the the Sinn, the Sinn Féin policy on not going into the South was really not a very good policy. It was kind of just a historical policy, it, like that it was to do with the Civil War. And you know, I think in reality, I don't see that as so much of a fold. You know, I think that was just kind of like a legacy policy that was around since the 1930s. That was a decision that was probably apt at the time, but kind of made no sense in the 1980s or the 1990s. But, you know, maybe I, I'll take the point. Look, I'm skeptical myself. Let's put it that way, Zoe, you know? I'm but skeptical. Also, I think the crucial thing is about, you know, achieving a stateless, classless society. And if you if you participate in the state, it transforms social movements such that they are no longer, they're not, they're, people aren't developing themselves into individuals who are capable of and driven to abolish capitalism in the state. They develop individuals who think politicians will save them. They develop people who are focused on the kind of election cycle as the means to achieve any social change and try to funnel social movements into that rather than on direct action, which can actually build towards revolution and crucially towards socialism rather than just the reproduction of the uh, existing class society where people get absorbed into it, thinking they're kind of making things better. And, you know, they don't change the state or capitalism to a huge extent. It changes them. And I think that's just going to keep on happening every time people try, uh, as anarchists said it would before lots of people actually tried to do it. You know, they were predicting this in, in the 1860s before these political parties had really been formed. And I think they were right. I think they were right, but I think don't think they might have, like, it mightn't have been as right as they think. That's the way I put it. And, you know, I think there's one thing we can agree on for sure is that, like, uh, de debt, just debt to the careerists, you know. <laughs> I guess to get the key point I'm making is, you know, it's not about intentions. It's about... Oh, I, I understand. It's structures about, about, and all that. About structures and also crucially about, you know, the kinds of people that you can attract to your social movement. But even even things like there are things that you could uh, absolutely do to negate that structure. Like, say, for example, you could have representatives only ever sit in one time, can only stay on a, a high committee for or whatever for for yeah. one three year period organizations where they, that's the case there are then often situations where they're like actually i'm um, you know we have this rule where i'm gonna break it <laughs> i'm gonna i know i'm gonna do I know. it a second time and you know that, that happens a the lot the cnt broke the rules too didn't they well actually yeah there, there were there was an anarchist called jose Perez who was really actually committed to the principle and even though it meant other people who weren't as good as him were in charge of the cnt he, you know, was committed to, yeah, like, I'm not going to be a uh, general secretary uh, of the oh, National yeah. Federation again, because he'd done his one term. That's how it has to be, like, that, yeah. like that's and how... He was really good and committed to it, but there were other people who uh, weren't, uh, they didn't have his principles, and they did, I think, run, like, two times, you know, more times than they're meant to on paper. But, yeah, it's... That says something about the actual organizational strength, I think, uh, uh, you know, as well. Well, this was during, this was after the, war. the, yeah, this was after the war. This is when they were in exile and a lot of them had PTSD. A lot of them were really depressed. Yeah, the, the organization wasn't as strong as it had been for those reasons. And there were a lot of personalities. It's easy for people to think that they should be in charge even of an anarchist trade union and that other yeah. people, you know, are doing it wrong. And if they were, they, if they were in certain key positions, they could, you know, make everything better. And, but often that is, uh, yeah. But they are wrong like... <laughs> about, about it, but they, they are true believers in their own abilities and think yeah. other people aren't as good as them. Like, yeah, unfortunately, people can still be people, uh, even in, even when all your organizational systems are, are well designed. If, if war should teach you anything, that the organization can go on, but you could, you could explode, you could shoot loads of the people. And if the organization, you know, will, will continue, you know, you get knocked down by a bus in the morning, the CNT will continue. Well, yeah, like, they were very effectively able to continue. It's just there was there was a lot of disagreement and infighting when they were in exile in France about what they should do. Exile never works well for parties of any type, as far as I can yeah, see. Yeah, no. no. <laughs> it's uh, like the death. But, in, but it was the case that Jose Perez, while in exile, continued to, because he was always very hardcore, principled about, about these things. He was one of the people whose newspaper critiqued the CNT during the war, and the higher committees tried to like stop him from printing his newspaper, but he was like very, very principled and committed to to those beliefs. So yeah, there's 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 a lot of agency even within these structures. Is the point where people with different personalities will respond differently to the same situation? 
And the careerists, goddamn careerists. Yeah, and the careerists will ruin everything. <laughs> they'll, fucking, <laughs> and, and, they'll fuck it up. And they exist in all kinds of organization. You know, you can be a careerist in a trade union and a party. Uh, it, it was even something that you I'd written down here. You you mentioned earlier about I think we're talking about the CNT and how there was only like two paid posts. But my experience is like from like like pay doesn't even come into it when it comes into people's fighting over bureaucracy. Obviously, it'll come in a bit, but like try and set up any little organization and like there will be fighting over roles even if there's zero money involved in it yeah no the idea i think this is pe- people don't always agree with one another and there and when there can be strong personalities that can have a negative effect on organizations because they are not good at working with other people so you know, there were some historic anarchists who ran newspapers who could really order other people about in the group about you know what we should put in the newspaper and how we should do it. And they were kind of control freaks, even yeah. though they thought of themselves as, yeah, I'm an anarchist. I believe in all these things, but they were still like not very nice to other people in the group who then would say like leave to go form a different newspaper just because they couldn't work with this guy. He was like just difficult to be around. Like there's some kind of, what's that? Is it like the, is it a critique of the, something of structurelessness? What's that? Marxists like to use it against anarchists, but there's a bit of truth in it sometimes, you know, where you don't well, have this, formal... This, this, was, this wasn't... This was, these were informal organisations, even. This was in both formal mm. and informal ones across all social movements I've ever read about. Just because some people have personalities such that they are, like, control freaks and are difficult to be around and other people have to deal with it or not deal with it and, like, go, like, bye, we're going to do our own thing. So, so some people aren't nice to be around even if they have all the good ideas on paper. And yeah, I don't yeah. think that's a product of, you know, st- of structurelessness, given that, you know, anarchist groups had lots of different kinds of structures, Structure. including the, even the, the informal affinity group organizations, rules on how we're going to make decisions and views on how we should relate to one another and treat one another. And that's still a big focus today, even in these, you know, non-structured organizations you know, with like a delegate system and things like that. And and again, anarchists spend lots of time developing systems of organization to try and prevent people being able to put themselves in positions of power over others within the organization and try to as much as possible have the membership deciding for themselves how things will be run rather than like a kind of bureaucracy rising that develops distinct interests. And I spend, they spend a lot of time trying to prevent that from happening. I don't know if you know that uh, Henry Kissinger quote was talking about like college politics. He was like, uh, the reason that university politics is so vicious is because the stakes are so small. You know, I think that's yeah, kind I, of- I think that can be the case for a lot of sects or small groups for sure. On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science and Swampside Chats. And if you'd like to help out the show, please remember to head over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollars.